Amen. We, we were there. We put it uh, in the language. Uh, I was there with him, Brother Stephen and I, Brother White. We put it in the language. We become ill. You know, I, I think it was mainly the pollution and whatnot. We weren't used to it. Things so tight. Going in and out of our hotel, it was like going out, out of an airport. They had security, everything there. He put us in that hotel for that. But you know, I think we were the first people to ever have a street meeting in Lahore. I, on, on, a, on a Saturday night, with the microphones turned up, that Islam could hear us for 10 miles away, we, we, we preached. <laughs> we, we did have a meeting that night. Now, say hello to them. Now, I'm going to let you speak to them for this. Hello, good morning. I'm very excited to be here this morning. And this is, I believe this is a wonderful time for all of us. Because I believe this is the last time we are. And the Lord really wants such men of God and women God who touch many nations. And I believe this is a time that we go and change a nation and bring the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, sir. Not, not only is this young man open up Pakistan. We, you'll see on the map behind him here in just a moment that we're, we're from one end of that country to the other. We have over, he'll tell you, over 500 missionaries out there now begin to affect that Muslim community. But he is the key to open us up all, to all of the Emirates states from Dubai all the way through. He has <coughs> contacts in them so that there'll be a those green markers will be off of there in a little while. He's supposed to set it up. Brother Stephen will probably be there in August to get it all. But listen to this testimony of this fine young man. Come in the booth back there. You got it? All right. Well, we'll we'll give that to you later. We sure will have it. He asked me about it last night, so we'd have it ready this morning, but it didn't work out that way. But it's a wonderful testimony. You'll hear it later uh, today. <clears throat> you know, we are on the threshold of having disciples in every nation of this world. Now, that's what he told us to do. You'll hear an exciting testimony. What's happening in the in in the in the Caribbean now, all across that world, Trinidad, down through there, a man will be with us on a Thursday, so impacted by this school that he has built us a school, dormitories and all. Said we need the van, just got us a van. I mean, it's just been that way all over this world where we've went, and and these has been. <coughs> Now we're on we're on the threshold of that happening. All we need we need you know one thousand people to give us five thousand dollars do the same thing as five thousand with one thousand but a combination of both I know we're going to make it. Amen. Some give more than that the five thousand. Fact is the first man I met one of the great dearest friend I've had. Along this list, first man I met here, he had to hold me up. He said, this is a gift from us. And I opened that gift up as 100 of those $1,000. Amen. I said, well, I know I'm on the right track. Amen. I know God talked. You know, the folks just don't come along and hand you them kind of things. They do when they have a vision uh, for the work of God. But that, that, that happened just right here. Come in here on a Monday night for the meeting. And I said, well, I, I know God's going to give it all. I'm going to preach this morning. Then these ushers, if we have any of them here, I don't know whether they're here this early or not. Seem like uh, things are running a little. If we don't, we'll draft some people. we got them right here, uh, plenty of them. <clears throat> and I'm going to give, excuse me, it takes a little while. You holler for 54 years like I have. Takes a little while. Brother Branko back here will tell you to get it all working early in the morning. <laughs> but I promise you it will work. It's never failed me yet in 54 years. <clears throat> but 
when, when I get through preaching this morning, the, the, these ushers are going to be here uh, with uh, those faith promise cards. And I, I want you, listen, I want you to honest. This is not something that you're going to, if you can't do, uh, that you're going to be in trouble with God. We'll just tear it up next year and start over. But I, I've found that if I commit myself to God, God will commit himself to me. And we're, we're, we, we know if God gives us that $5 million, we'll remove every green sticker off of this map, and we'll have disciples in every nation every nation on this planet. I don't know if that's ever been done before in the history of this world in so short a time. But God said He's going to do a quick work, and I believe that quick work, He's chosen us certainly to be a part of it. Amen. So you you keep that in mind. If you don't want to fill it out this morning when they give it to you, you, you think it over. We'll be talking to you uh, all along, and you, you think it over and fill it out. Give it to us before you go back. But think on that. What would you like God to have you to do? I believe this message will say it all here this morning. My message, we must will to do the will of God. That's a message I want to bring to you this morning. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. We must will to do the will of God. Of God. I want you to believe with me now, Father, thank you as we read the Word of God, as we speak the Word of God, help us to hear the Word of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. You know, everywhere you look, there are signs that say to the elect of God that Jesus is a coming. I don't care who you are. If you have any interest in spiritual matters, then you know Christ is about to come. But you know, it's an amazing thing. I find the world is more interested in what God has to say about this end time than the church does. I, you, you talk to a businessman, does God have anything to say about the days? They all realize, and Dr. Dodds and I were in Israel uh, with the brethren that were with us uh, earlier in last year when we were there the last time, I believe it was November. We found troubled people, amen, people saying, we know things are not going to stay like they are. One man said to me, this, this, this Megiddo is going to be full of blood. Amen. He just knew. They knew something. Something is in the making, folks. Christ is about to come. There's no doubt that we're witnessing the perilous times spoken of by the Apostle Paul. We are that people. <clears throat> Every nation on earth is in turmoil this morning, and the problems are with perplexity. They don't have any answers to the problems. We're trying. Politicians talk all the way around the world simply because they don't know where they're going or what to do. But with all this, it's no time for you and I to be discouraged, folks. It doesn't matter what it looks like. For these are the very conditions that create the true church her greatest opportunity. Her greatest opportunity. We sent Brother Josh and us, we sent 460 people into that tsunami area in India. Well, when I got there, they never let me in. They locked Brother White and I up, and they never let us in. But I had Brother Osborne. You heard his testimony. I just put $30,000 in his pocket and sent him out to nobody who didn't know. Amen. He said, that's easy for you to say. You heard him testify. But they went there. And we sent them. We sent them into that. But I never got to go. And while I was up there, I was so troubled. I, you know, about. I said maybe we're too late. We probably ought to have been here when the tsunami first hit. But I believe as God said to me, "No, you're here at the right time. If you'd have been here when it first hit, they couldn't have hurt you. They're looking for their dead. They're looking for their problems. But today, there's nothing left but despair. And I'm the answer to that." 
I'm the only answer to that. That's where we are today, folks. Amen. This world is in trouble. It knows it's in trouble. They're looking for help outside of itself. They're open. The harvest of the earth has come. I can tell you because men, those that denied any supernatural thinking 50 years ago, are turning to the New Age Hinduism and to Christianity wherever we get there to tell them about it. It's a time to be alive when there's nothing left but despair. We have our greatest opportunity to tell men about this Christ. In desperate times such as we live in, men and women are driven to search for that which is real. They, they played all the games. You know, I've discovered, all you, you know, if you're going to keep the tares, you've got to entertain them. But if you're going to keep saints, you've got to challenge them, folks. There's got to be something in that house to challenge me, to rise up and challenge the night. Now, if you've go, you got those, those that just want to be religious and hope they can go to heaven by coming to church to play games, you're going to have to have games for them to play. But if you're going to turn saints into soldiers, you've got to challenge them with the gospel of Christ. You got to say to men, you can do anything God said for us to do. We can go anywhere He said for us to go, cross any river, broke down any wall, cast out any devil, do whatever God's called us to do. We can do it. We must know it. You and I have been brought to the kingdom for such a moment as this. Listen to this in Esther 4:14. If thou altogether hold your peace, I believe we have been called. To the kingdom for such a moment as this. You know the story of Esther. There's a day set for all the Jews to be killed. Mordecai said to her, If you hold your peace at this time, then shall enlargement and deliverance uh, arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether you're come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He, while he said there, if you don't rise up to the challenge, you and yours will perish, but deliverance will come. If you and I want, somebody will. God is going to win, folks, and the church he's coming after is going to be a glorious church. And if he comes for anything less than he started for, started with, if he comes for anything less than he started with, then he failed to build a church. I said he failed to build a church. He's not coming out for a game playing, wore out religious program. He's coming after a people that rise up to challenge the darkness, that recognize we're greater, far greater than whatever hell has to throw against us. We can win. We are winning. We will win. Somebody is going to cross that river. <clears throat> Somebody is going to cross it. Now, these words I just read were spoken to Esther, a queen at that time. Now, when it seemed that everything was about to be lost, a day had been set for every Jew to die, every person of God. Now, we live in a very similar time to Esther. Spiritual death abounds, folks. Amen. The lamps are gone out. I don't care how you look at it. There's a lot of things. When we come to a place that we'd sacrifice truth for numbers, it's a dark, dark day in history. I can tell you that. And we're there today. Men will do anything to get a crowd. Somebody just wrote a book telling you how to build a mega church without the Bible. I tell you it's going to be a bestseller because that's all they're after. But what we're after is to make Christ alive on this planet. Let Jesus live. Across this world, you're looking, our whole motive was that if we can make men and women pregnant with the life of God, put them anywhere on this planet, to birth that life, there'll be a church. I said there'll be a church, not just a religious something, but there'll be a church. We proved it over and over again. Now these, listen, these are, we live in such a day. According to the prophet Joel, there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Amen. For the day of the Lord is near, he said, in the valley of decision. That's in Joel 3.14. 
Now in Psalms 119, 126, these are the conditions, listen, that open the way for God to show himself strong. That Psalm says, it's time for thee to work, for they have made void thy law. Not only the world has made it void, but the church has made void the law of God. Amen. Anything goes. There's no connection between believing and behavior in our time. Amen. Anything goes just so you come to church on a Sunday morning. But that isn't the way it is, folks. We are born again. We're the aliens on this planet. We're born from above. We're not a part of the system down here. And they must be able to recognize. The cry sounded in the 50th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, I believe, is, is echoing around this world today. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going, weeping they shall go, seek the Lord their God, they shall ask the way to Zion. You know, Zion is the name of Jerusalem. It was called that when it was what God wanted it to be. It was always Jerusalem when it was out of sync with God. They were saying, we know about Jerusalem. We know about the leg stretching. We know about the teaching people how to talk in tongues. But we want to find our way back to God. We bounced around with these schemes of religion. Show us the way back to reality. That was a prophecy of Mr. Wigglesworth in 1922, the year I was born, on this planet in Los Angeles, California. He stood and prophesied. I talked to the lady that was a pastor, 86 years old, in 1954. She sponsored him there. Said one night he rose and prophesied. Now the, the revival out of Azusa Street was 16 years old. He said the present revival will die. But in the mid-40s, God will breathe new life into the corpse. But there be so much emphasis on the physical. And I watched it. If you didn't have a tumor, mister, it wasn't any need going to those meetings. It just got to be a physical thing. And he said there'll be so much emphasis on the physical that God will withdraw himself in the late 50s. And there'll be a time of religious and political confusion like the world has never seen. But just before he returns, they're going to turn back. Show us the way to Zion. Oh, hallelujah to God. I, I've watched in this city, pastor in this church for 50 years, and now 14 years with the School of Christ. I've watched men as they've chased after the, uh, after the games of men. I refuse to go. Amen. There's a lot of money, a lot of people out there. But I knew someday they're going to turn back. Somebody is going to have to be here to tell them where the reality is again. Somebody must be here. Listen, the prophet said of God's people, they've gone from mountain to hill. They've forgotten their resting place. That is his testimony. What a picture of the church. In the 21st century, from mountain to hill, from one pseudo-experience to another, amen, just moving down the line from one game to another, amen, all along, the cry has reached the ear of God. We're about to experience, folks, a vast harvest of souls. I believe we're in the time of the revelation when he said, thrust in your sickle. It's time to reap this harvest. But for God, for God to do His mighty work, there must be a human instrument for which and through which He can work. Every real work of God was birthed in the bosom of some man before it ever showed up on this planet. God had within that man everything to make it work. Moses never went to Egypt with a plan. He just went there to do what he's told and winds up with a church of three million people. I, I, you see what I'm telling you? It's time to turn back to hear what God is saying. Like Esther, you and I have been chosen to be the vessel through which God's deliverance will come. We, we, in this room, there are those of us that God has showed. Mordecai charged Esther that she should go unto that king to make supplication unto him, to make requests from that king for the people of God. 
Now Esther sent this word back to Mordecai. Listen, all the king's servants and people of the king's providence do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, queen or ordinary, shall come into the king, into the inner court, who has not been called, there's one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out his golden scepter, that he may live. But Mordecai, I'm sure she called his name, but I've not been called to come into the king for 30 days. You understand Mordecai. I walk in there without being invited. I'm probably going to die. Do you know what you're asking of me? And I know there's people in here. Do you know what God is asking of you? I can tell you what he's asking. Love not your life unto death. If this isn't worth everything, it's worth nothing, folks. You never know you believe anything until you're willing to die for it. You never come to a place until you come to that place with God. Listen, to be the vessel through which God can work has always been costly. It costs something. God's word to Esther was, if you hold your peace, that is, you refuse to act, you're not believing anything if you don't. Deliverance will come from another source. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows, Esther, whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, it will be costly, I can tell you, for you and I to hold our peace at this time. It's going to cost something to go. But I can tell you it's going to cost a lot more if we don't go. The cost of not going, the cost of refusing to obey God is beyond my ability to put it into words, folks. Amen. To be the vessel through which he can work. Amen. Since the end is always contained in the beginning always returns there, then this final generation is destined to repeat the success of that first generation church. We will, somebody in this generation will reach this generation. Somebody is going to come to the end of it and say like the Apostle Paul, all the world has heard this wonderful gospel. That shall be a reality. God's word to the true believer is, whatsoever things ever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Now that's in Mark 11:24. Now the verb believe, listen closely, is conviction. The Bible said if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, now, the word believe is the action verb for faith. Amen. It is a conviction. The whole of it, you see, the, the word believe is a conviction. The meaning is you do not stop praying until you actually see the miracle or have the witness that it's already been given. That's what he meant when he said men ought always to pray and not faint. In, in the first year of my preaching, my wife and I was preaching this gospel. Well, when we first begun, he gave us two experiences that taught me this truth in a way. He let me know something that I preached around this world. Number one, he let me die. Three heart attacks. Fell out in a pulpit, a nurse there. I never went to a doctor who had died. don't have no problem anybody else that does. But she said he's had a massive heart attack. Well, I revived. They took me to the parsonage. had the second. And I could hear her. She could find no pulse. She said he's dead. Amen. Well, I'm like Ben Franklin. That's a great exaggeration because I'm still here tonight or this morning. But she pronounced me dead. But my wife wouldn't turn loose or come back took me to a farm where her parents lived, and the third night there, I had the third one. Well, when she woke up, so much fluid had gone out of my body, it went through that mattress. It just, just total. And she thought it was dead, but it wasn't. I still lived. I had her to take me to a hotel room. I, that is, somebody said that's a terrible thing to do. No, it was the only thing to do. I knew I had to touch God. It wasn't a matter of my saying I'm healed and thanking God for healing. I knew I had to touch the Almighty. 
I went there. They took me and put me in the ninth room in that little hotel. And for nine days, I hardly got off of my knees. I couldn't breathe uh, below my Adam's apple. I was so sick. I started reading in the book of Genesis, read all the way to the book of Psalms before I come to the answer. But at 3 o'clock in the morning on the ninth day, I come to Psalms 9 and 10. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek you. A hand reached inside of this rib cage, squeezed this heart. I was made as whole as I've ever been. That's the reason I'm going like I'm going tonight. i got a 50-year-old heart in this body. God God made it well. Had a physical examination and a doctor said, you got the best heart ever saw in a man your age, but you've had trouble, terrible scars on that heart. Oh, I said, I bear the marks of that blessed Christ. Yes, sir, that moment. I said, that moment. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I never quit praying until it happened. I said, I never quit praying. Wasn't a matter of me saying, Jesus, heal me, then getting up and saying, thank you for doing it. No, I got up when I'm well. But the second experience I had, we were in Houston, Texas, 1954. We had preached a week in a little church, seat about 300. Every evening at 6 o'clock, the fire marshal was there to shut the door. Nobody else could get in. God was on the move. That church was so full of people, they couldn't get into the fire marshal, wouldn't let them in. Well, come Sunday, the pastor wouldn't know if I'd stay another week. I agree. Woke up Monday morning, that pretty lady of mine around her mouth looked like this shirt I've got on. Just blisters, white as you can see, all the way down her throat. Her fever rose so high that she just come and went. She d knew and didn't know. By noon, both of those babies had the same thing. I prayed all day long. There'd never been a man more desperate. I prayed, listen, outside of God, that's everything. That's everything. I never prayed harder in my life as a wrestle with God. At night, I locked that motel, went to that church. I, I preached. I told them. I told him what God, or what has happened in that motel. The pastor, he said he had the gift of healing. He felt it in his hand. I said, Pastor, I want you to go with me tonight. That family is very sick. He said, I'm too tired. I said, no, look, you don't know how sick they are. He said, no, I'll come in the morning. Well, I went back that night, all night long, I prayed. They're just exactly like it was when I left. They never turned over. A nurse told me they had to have pneumonia, to have his high fever never turn over on that bed. But I prayed all night long. About 9 o'clock, that preacher came. When he walked into that motel, looked at him, he ran outside, just ran out the door. I said, come on in here. Lay that hand on them with that gift of healing. There, there's something going on. He said, I'm not coming in there. I saw too much of it. He said, they got diphtheria. you got to get a doctor. I said, the only doctor I know in Houston, his name is Jesus. I've been trying to get him in this motel for two days. He left me. Every devil in Houston come. I'm telling you, every devil in Houston left everybody else. I'm telling you, God taught me something. With that verse, he said, don't you quit praying. Men ought always to pray and don't stop. That's what he said. Till you get an answer, folks. I said, till you get an answer, for God's sake. Hang on to God. He healed my heart. Now I'm pressing in for my family. I, I went that next night. I, I went to that church. They, they haven't moved, just laying on that bed. I prayed all day long. I preached that night or devil's real. I hadn't preached for about 20 minutes when about 20 young people from 15 to 18 or 19 years old stood up in unison. My God have mercy on us, they screamed. They ran into that altar crying out for the mercy of God. When people come in, amen, people come in that altar with them. I went out that side door. I drove across that Houston to that motel, crying so hard I couldn't hardly see the road. But I said to God, I'm not leaving that motel till you tell me what's going to happen to my family. If you take them, that'll be the worst thing ever happened to me. But I'll praise you as their spirits go out that window. But if you heal them, I'll tell them in that convention in 2007. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, hallelujah to God. 
I come in there exactly like I left them, laying in that bed. Amen. That girl of mine, that little girl uh, back there and there, and that son of mine, just a year between them, and my wife. I knelt down. They had, we'd had a little cot. They'd slept one, the other, just three and four years old. Me and my wife were in bed. Now then, the bed with her, and that cot become my altar. I knelt down there at 10 o'clock. I, I never prayed. The man, they, they just good thing that there was separation between that little motel, sheet place. Or they, they, nobody slept in that place. They, you could hear me a mile away. I'm agonized. I said, I'm not leaving that motel unless they take me out violently until you tell me what's going to happen to my family. I started at 10 o'clock. All of a sudden, seemed like it's four hours later. I didn't know it. But I knew somebody's in that room. Oh, I knew. A fear come on me. How'd they get here? There's no closet, just a nail to hang your clothes on. There's a bathroom. I've been there. Nobody there. The only window's got a window fan. And I'm looking at the door. How did somebody get in here? And as I sat there, my heart beat at a 200 miles. A hand on my shoulder said, Son, go to bed. Everything's all right. I'm telling you, there was no difference in them. They're exactly the same. The fever's running 104, 105. The blisters are everywhere. There's no physical sign. But I knew it was well. You understand what I'm saying? You pray till it happens or till you know it happens. I knew they were well. I went to bed at 2 o'clock. I woke up that cot is shaking. A little four-year-old boy standing there said, Papa, I'm hungry. And that little girl coming around the corner said, I'm starving. That little 22-year-old girl sat up in that bed said, If we got anything to eat, the long night was over. Oh, I said, the long night was over. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. I come here to tell you can touch God. You, you, you can wrestle around. Jesus taught me what real faith is, folks. He didn't confession. Oh, no. He didn't what they call confession out there. Real faith is a relationship with this God that knows he'll answer. I read that story of that Syrophoenician woman a hundred times. But some time ago, I read it. And God said to that woman, said she had to great faith. I said, if that's great faith, then that means every element of faith is there. So I backed up and looked at it. Two things are found. Number one, she knew he could. There's nobody in this audience doesn't know he can. If I ask how many of you believe God could do anything, I'd have a 100% answer. But the second part was she knew he would. And she said, I'm not going anywhere till the devil's out of my daughter. Insult me, call me a dog, do whatever you want to be with me, sir. I'll eat crumbs that fall off this table. But when I leave you, sir, you got me on your hands till my daughter is free of that devil. Don't come to me of that game of prayer. I can tell you, you can touch God. Oh, yes, sir. Amen. The whole key is it was said. You can touch him. He taught me, Luke 18, he said men ought always to pray. And Luke 18 and 1, then he told about a woman that went to an unjust judge, said, I need some help. He wouldn't help her, but she kept a coming. Finally, he said, I don't fear God, I don't fear man, but this woman will drive me crazy. She's going nowhere until I avenge of her adversary. She's not going to leave. She'll be here every morning when I come to this office. And so he delivered her. You know what God said? How much more will your heavenly Father deliver them that cry day and night? Oh, hallelujah to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah! How much more shall your heavenly Father... You know what the next word he said? Without changing the subject. Nevertheless, that just simply means a continuation. Will I find any faith in the earth? Will I find the people that will just get a hold of me and hold on till there's an answer? Oh, yes, sir. Will I find that kind of a faith? Very rare to find it, I'll tell you. I said very rare to find the kind of a faith that will hold on till it happens. This is a 
true meaning of faith that he gave in Luke 18. Faith is an act based upon the Word of God, supported by the confidence in a continuing action of believing that whatever God said, God will do, folks. I don't know how long. I don't know how long. Uh, it took Isaiah, but he said, in the year Uzziah died, he saw God. That is, he prayed through something less than 12 months. But in that year, he saw God. He prayed his way to God. He never got out and said, God, reveal something to me, then jumped up and said, thank you, and forgot about it. He prayed till he knew that there's an answer coming. God can be touched, is what I'm telling you. If you will believe him, that's, that is a conviction. I said, that is a conviction. Believe that God will. Amen. This faith transubstantiates things hoped for uh, uh, to, to, what, to everything else. It hoped for. Transubstantiation means a crossover. You know, the King James people were afraid to use that because the way it was used by the Catholics. You know, their transubstantiation was that that bread turned to flesh and that, that wine turned into blood. So they were afraid, but it's a good word. It means a crossover. What this verse claims, that as long as faith is being expressed, as long as I say unto God, my family's got to be well. You see, the crossover begun. That which is in heaven is about to become a reality on this earth. And three children, two children, and a wife are going to get up well. You understand what I'm telling you? That's, that's what I'm talking about. The, the invisible is about to become visible. As men pray, that starts. Abraham believed God. He gave glory to God for 25 years. He held on, believed on. God said, you're going to have a baby. He tried Hagar, his own, the worst thing he ever had to do in his life. Listen, the worst thing he had to do is get rid of what he produced. Tell me. He loved Ishmael, folks. It wasn't an easy thing to put him out in the desert. But I can tell you it's better to lag a little behind than it is to outrun God. Because whatever you produce, you will have to kill. Make no mistake about it. Whatever you produce, whatever you're making, it won't work in here. I said it will not work in this place. Not in the, in the kingdom of God. Amen. What this verse claims is that as long as faith is being expressed, transubstantiation begins and continues, and as long as faith is maintained, that process continues. What is hope? That is what every settled in heaven is crossing over to time. That's what hope is. That's a, that, that is the hope. The, the substance of heaven's reality is crossing into time to become what heaven says it is. And I got a new heart one night at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yes, sir. That, that's, that's the meaning. Listen, the, in the first 12 months of my preaching career, God allowed me to pass through those situations. Amen. The final harvest only awaits those who desire fervently enough to pray and believe for it to be reaped. Amen. Not no little lay me down to sleep prayer meeting in the mornings, but lay in a hope of God. Amen. The praying this man ever walked this planet was Jesus Christ. He got up a long while before day to pray, prayed all night, and this book is telling me he right now is making intercession for me. He's always in a prayer meeting. If it's important for him to be there, it's important for me to be there, folks. Amen. If he had to pray, amen, how much more? This final harvest await those who desire fervently enough to pray for it till it's reaped. Abraham is a perfect example of desiring, praying, and believing. A perfect. Listen to it. Abraham desired one thing that was to please God. Nothing, nothing else. So the Scripture says... Abraham believed God, and that believing was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now, how did his believing manifest itself? Abraham always, under every circumstance, willed to do the will of God. Amen. No matter what God spoke to, speaks to you, let me tell you some folks, whatever he talks to you, do it. In this convention, he speaks to you about being a part of this harvest, helping us to finish it. Whatever he tells you, commit yourself to it. Amen. I tell you all he needs. He doesn't want production. He just wants commitment. 
Amen. My friend here preached a message, stirred me much as anything ever heard. He talked about a contribution or a commitment. Most of our dealings are just a contribution, amen, instead of a lifelong commitment that whatever I have, I own nothing. Amen. I belong to him. I'm only a steward. I lost my name. I have to sign his name now to anything that I own. So the scripture says Abraham believed God. Abraham did what he was told. Abraham came to God a sinner to be forgiven and to receive all good from the mercy of God. He simply believed what God said and will to obey what he said. Will to obey him. Listen to it. He prostrated every doubt, every fear, every objection or reason before the divine testimony and promise. Didn't matter what his reason told him. He had to be a brilliant man. He, without hesitation, took Isaac to that mount to offer him. Everything God promises tied up in that boy. But without a hesitation, he took him. He never questioned how God could make his own word good. He just did what he was told. So you see in Abraham that faith and works are both fountain and stream. You know, Luther wanted to throw the book of James out. Amen. That's because he didn't know what, what, what James was saying. James just saying, you show me your faith without your works and I'll show you mine by my works. And I'll tell you, the Bible said we'll be judged there by works, whether good or bad. And that just simply means whether you believed or didn't believe. You cannot separate this, folks. Make no mistake about it. If you believe God, you do what God tells you. I found that all over. We planted this church across this earth. We planted them uh, in, in the, in the, in the uh, Andes, across the top of the Andes in Peru. Not second class citizen, third class. As far as Peru, we taught them anywhere that men can live, this church can exist. You don't have to have help from somebody else. All they had is potatoes. They grew potatoes. Amen. Ten different kinds of potatoes. I said, you get ten men saved, teach them to tithe. You'll have as many potatoes as anybody else. And a preacher's in trouble. It wants more than what his people has anyway. Just get them tithe. You'll have many potatoes anybody this, this, this works. We proved it. Amen. I could move to Russia tomorrow. I wouldn't need no support from nobody. That church out there that we were brought in to be in, amen, I'd just move out there and be the head bishop of that church tomorrow. <laughs> amen. Because I taught them. You understand? I taught them to tithe. I, I didn't. I had to fight with the existing system. They didn't believe tithing was a part of it. One bishop said to me, I want you to buy me a PA system. He said, it'd be about $10,000. I said, I just can't do that. Oh, he said, why not? You don't have the money. Oh, I've got the money, but I couldn't buy it. Why not? I said, I'd have to use the tithe, and you don't believe in that. He become a believer in tithing. <laughs> you see in Abraham then that faith and works are both fountain and The one is in the heart. I said that faith is in the heart and invisible to man until it comes to surface in the deeds. You you can talk about believing, but it's a facade if you don't do what you're told. No, no. You're just you're just talking faith. If you don't do what you're told, you see, that faith in this heart, if it's real, it must come to surface in the deeds. If your faith does not manifest itself in an act of obedience, then your faith is a pretense. You never believed anything. No, no. If it doesn't, if it doesn't manifest itself in obedience to God, you see that in Abraham. You cannot separate faith and obedience, nor can you separate unbelief and, and disobedience. You cannot separate them. If Abraham had refused to obey God because his assignment was too hard, his faith would have proved itself to be a dead thing. Devils have that kind of faith. That's what the Bible says, that they believe, but they don't do anything about it. God's word is, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Now that's found in Psalms, uh, Proverbs rather 8, 17. You know, I've read that many times. And, and, you know, God writes things in the Bible every night. 
Seems like to me. I've got a front door neighbor's an attorney. He said, you read that Bible still? I said, all the time. I said, I don't read the law book anymore. I know that. I said, but this is a living book, Mr. Landry. I said, I wake up some morning. God wrote something I know last night. God read this book 250 times and found something in there this morning. Didn't know was there. Yes, sir. You see, I, I read this Proverbs 8, 17. He, God says, I love them that love me. I will love them that love me. I know, I know that that, 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 that there's no favorness in God. God loved me while I was yet a sinner. Amen. So what is he saying here? What is God saying? I know that the love of God, amen, extended to you and I while we were yet sinners before we could do anything. But now talking to you and I said, I will love them that love me. Every promise in this Bible is preceded by a command. Every one of them. I know folks that got that little promise box. That's all the Bible they ever read. Every morning while they eat breakfast, they'll pull one of those little promises out and read it. That's the extent of the Bible reading. Now one of them is, is Exodus 15, 26. And when you pull that card out, it has quotation mark, three little periods, and then I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Those periods say something missing here. Something not here. You know what's missing? If you keep my commandments, obey my statutes, I'm your Lord. I'm your Lord. And I'll heal you. You understand? He said, if you love me enough, and he said, your love is demonstrated how, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you will do what I tell you to do. Amen. If you don't, if you don't do what he tells you, you don't love God, or else the Bible's wrong. You found a new Bible. But what he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so he said, if you love me by keeping these commandments, I'll love you by healing you. I'll make this promise real to you. I'll love you back if you love me by doing what I tell you to do. I'll love you back. Amen. Since God's love is not conditional, that's the meaning of that. Again, God's word is, if you love me, keep my commandments. Every promise is preceded by a command, and if you ignore the command, you can forget about the promise. I, the man, took ever knew a man, took every promise out of this Bible and made it what he called a promise Bible. That's all it was, just the promises. He asked me, he said, what do you think about it? Oh, it was selling. He's making a ton. He said, what do you think? I said, I thank you in bad trouble. Bad trouble. I said, you making money, sir. But God said, you take anything away from this book, you are in trouble. And you can't take these promises out of the environment and make them work. No, no. You pull them away from that command. They will not work for you. You can pray. You can, you, can, you, can, you can decide a lot of things about it. But unless you are willing to accept it as it is, amen. Amen. Listen, every promise in the Word is preceded by that. So if we pretend faith, then refuse to do what we believe to be the will of God, we prove ourselves never to believe from the heart in Christ in the first place. Thus our deeds and our words are to be brought to the judgment as a test of our faith of our, or our unbelief. Words don't count, folks. No, no. Words alone don't count. Our deeds, our actions will be brought to that judgment to prove whether we believed or didn't believe. Amen. All along this line. He said to that church, Go you in all the world, preach this gospel to every creature. That's the word of God to us. I, you'll never find a preacher says he doesn't believe, believe that, but he'll have penny marches for missions. Amen. Doesn't believe nothing. I said he doesn't believe nothing. He can talk, you can speak, but you don't believe till you do. Amen. If you and I'll simply will to do the will of God, listen. If you and I in this room will will to do the will of God, nothing can stop us from reaching this generation for Christ. Nothing. All he asks is you and I to will to do the will of God. Hallelujah. Lift your hands with me. Oh, let's ask him to help us. Oh, God. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.